Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here today. You can be seated. <clears throat> so good to be in the house of the Lord. What a beautiful presence of the Lord is in this place today. Amen. I love what I feel. Amen. This is going to be a it's going to be a historic week. And um, the late Paul Harvey said in two of his noonday broadcast, he said, the coming home of the red cow is the next forecastable world event. He said there was a Yiddish writing that had been recently rediscovered that had named some very important events down to the very letter in the life of Israel all the way up to the Iraqi war, even to the point of naming some of the countries that were involved. He went on to say, this, however, is not what excited the Orthodox Jew, but it was the event immediately following that, and that was the redemption of Israel. He said, Israel cannot be redeemed until she repents, and she cannot repent until she comes home and the red cow will call her home. The prayer of the Jew is Messiah come home. Messiah come home. End of quote. <clears throat> I've said it here before many times. You that attend here know this is a subject I've covered many times. Just going to touch a couple of things on it today. But there were no seats, no chairs, no benches in the temple or the tabernacle because the work of the priest, the blood work was never finished. It's never a place to sit down because it's never finished. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 said, and every priest standeth, he standeth daily, ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. There was no such thing as remission of sins in the Old Testament. They did the same routine sacrifice. Everything was absolute perfection. But even if they did the very best they could, all it did was kick the sin down the road for another year, another decade, another century. It could never take away sin. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 12 said, But this man, speaking of Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because the blood work was finished. The temple and the tabernacle had no chairs, no stools, no benches. No place to sit down because the blood work was never finished. But Jesus Christ finished the blood work. Why is that important? To stress to you that we as the church, we, we are excited about what's going to happen Friday or what's scheduled Friday in Israel. But the church doesn't need a red heifer. The church doesn't need any more blood on an altar to be spilt because Jesus finished the blood work. But the Jews do need that. They need that. And God has finally provided one at the perfect time in human history. So we, whatever you're doing this week, don't go about your day and forget that what the Jews consider to be the most important, the most important prophetic event since the rebirth of Israel in 1948 is going to take place Friday morning in Israel. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. And I'll talk about that in just a little while. I want to take a little bit of time to get to where I'm going to go. Even before I give you my title today. But I want to go to the book of Acts. The second chapter. I'd really like to read this whole chapter. But there's not enough time for that. So I'm going to skip a little bit here. Maybe... Maybe most of you know enough about it to fill in the blanks. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 said, And when the day of Pentecost 
was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Verse 12 said, Now there they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? They were gathered there for the Feast of Pentecost, Jews, the Bible said, from all over the world. They had come there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And now these men and women, 120 of them, they're in the upper room and they're spilling out into the street and they're speaking in tongues. They're staggering around, probably doing a lot like what you've seen here today. And when the Jews saw them, it was definitely out of order. When they saw them, they were amazed and they were in doubt or they were confused. And they were asking one another, what's going on? What, what just happened? What, what's going on with these people? And the Bible said in verse 13, others mocking said these men are full of new wine. The ignorant are the ones that start the mocking. They always betray their ignorance because they mock. Somebody said, what's going on? What's happening here? And those that didn't have the answers, they just mocked it, said, don't even wait for an answer. They're drunk. They're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He said, you can mock it, but you're wrong. You're wrong. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's saying this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. And then he quotes from Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. This is exactly the promise that God gave to the children of Israel that he would not just be with them, he would be in them. This is the promise that God gave that he would not just be with us, he would be in us. And Paul said, it was Christ in you that is the hope of glory. So Peter is telling those that were well-versed in the Old Testament scripture that we're not drunk, we've not lost our minds, we're not crazy. We have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father that the scripture said would happen. Now, before I go on here, I want to tell you that Luke was the one that wrote this. Luke and Mark were two of the gospel writers, as we call them, but Luke and Mark did not walk with Jesus. They were converts of the Apostle Paul. So they were not there. Luke was a physician, and his, his gospel reads like the book of Acts, which it looks like he is an investigative journalist. He's an investigator, and he's letting Theophilus, Theophilus, who he had wrote the first and second books that he wrote, he's writing this to him, and he says to him that these things that I wrote to you, I want you to know they're confirmed. He's saying, I did all the interviews, I checked all the stories, so what I'm writing to you about from this man called Jesus, from, from his death, burial, resurrection, all of the things that happened, I'm telling you, it's all confirmed. You can be confident what I'm telling you is the absolute truth. This is exactly how it happened. So now he's writing here what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter's not write, writing this. Luke is writing this. He's writing after talking to critics and other eyewitnesses. And verse number 36 said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, this is still part of the message that Peter is preaching, 
that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 said, Now when they heard this, the same ones that thought they were drunk, they had lost their minds and mocked them. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, they were under strong, heavy conviction, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Is there anything we can do? He's talking to the worst sinners that ever lived on the face of the earth. For 4,000 years, they've been waiting for a Messiah to appear. He came to them. He walked among them. He healed their sick. He cast out devils. He delivered them. He even raised their dead. And for all the good that he did, they nailed him to a cross and rejected him. And when they heard this, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. It must have sent chills up and down their spine. They realized how guilty they were. And now these men are not afraid. Peter is preaching to them, and he's not afraid to tell them, you're the ones responsible for killing the Messiah. I want that settle in on you just a minute. These are the worst sinners that have ever lived in history. Everything above them is up. Wherever category you fit in, you're up from that. Whatever you've done, you may have done it in ignorance. They killed the Messiah. And that God didn't want it, so he raised him from the dead. Can you imagine the guilt they must have been feeling? When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Is there anything we can do? Is there any hope for us? Then Peter said unto them, yes, there is something you can do. Now, if we would, we would look at a modern church, they say, what can we do? Everybody would just start reaching for your checkbook. They're going to take up an offering. In Congress, what can we do? Everybody's going to reach for a checkbook. Because everybody thinks you've got to pay the man if you want a favor. You've got to pay for it if you want a gift. You've got to pay for it if you want favor. But Peter said unto them, yes, there's something you can do. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You've got to do it for yourself. Your father can't get baptized for the whole family. You can't have a representative of the children to get baptized for the family. You've got to do it yourself. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. You've got to do it for yourself in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You never had that option before. But this time, they're going to be gone. What's going to happen in that water is not going to kick them down the road for another year. You're not going to have to come back and get baptized again. Once you go down in that water, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are going to be gone forever. I know you killed the Messiah, but that water's got enough power to remove that, st that stain from the record, and God will never remember it again. You can face Jesus in the judgment, and he's going to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Your guilt is going to be gone. That's what you can do. That's all you can do. And then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward, this warped generation. This was the answer to the question that they had just asked. What shall we do? What must we do? Is there anything we can do to save ourselves? Peter responded by saying, yes, there is something you can do. There is something you can do. If you want, if you want to be right with God, you're going to have to take the first step. If you want to get the stain off of your record, 
there is something you can do to save yourself. When we repent and we're baptized in Jesus' name, we are doing the only thing we're able to do. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I got somewhere I want to go with this today. But after you do, you do what only you can do. I want you to know repentance and baptism is not what God does. God doesn't do that to save you. That's what you do. That's your part. Look, I'm not trying to offend anybody today, but I'm telling you, just believing in Jesus is not enough to save you. The Bible said that the devil believes in one God and he trembles. The devil is not saved. Believing is not enough. If you believe, you've got to obey what the word of God said. If you want to be saved, what shall we do? What can we do? What must we do? If you do what you can do by making an approach to God, repentance is making an approach to God. That's your first move toward him. And I'm telling you, if you bypass that plan, if you bypass that first step, if you don't repent, you can go straight to the water. But all you're doing is getting wet. It's not effective. It won't make any difference. You have first got to spend some time in an altar and repent of your sins. You've got to let God know I'm sorry for what I've done. Everything in my past I want you to wash it away. I had ignorance then. I didn't know what I was doing. But now I know my sin was against you and I need to be forgiven. I want to give my life to you. When you make that step of repentance, your sins are forgiven. Hear me. They are forgiven. You don't pass by the altar of repentance and think that I'll just go to the water and It'll do it. No, something happens when you really repent. And I'm going to tell you that's why a lot of people never get the baptism of the Holy Ghost after they repent and they go get baptized and they stay in the church for years seeking after God. There is no tarrying process in the scripture. The day of Pentecost was the only time they tarried. It was for 10 days until it would come. After that, all you got to do is repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Our problem is our people go to the water and they've not repented. When people get out of the water and then they never come back to church again, they just all carried a sign saying, I didn't repent. I didn't really mean it. If you wanted to be saved, you knew you had a role to play. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And when you do your part, then in making an approach to God, he will do his part in making an approach to you. I'm telling you, I believe God fills people with the Holy Ghost, but I can't give you the Holy Ghost. Nobody in this building can give you the Holy Holy Ghost. We can't take you in a back room and teach you how to speak in tongues in a book. We can't do it through a phonics class. If you want the Holy Ghost, you got to really repent. And if you'll repent, there'll be no waiting. He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost in the altar of repentance. And then when you're baptized in his name, your sins are gone. They're remitted. You're perfectly pure and clean before God. And he will make an approach to you. Verse 41, after you do, you do what you can do in your approach to God. Verse 41 said, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I heard Brother, Brother Cunningham Tell her, I think it was in the Philippines. They went to the Philippines. They were having some crusade there. And so they had set out chairs. They had chairs in the front. And, and the way they knew how, how many people would get the Holy Ghost is they would tell them at the end of the, the, the service when they were having an altar service, everybody that wants the Holy Ghost, if you want the Holy Ghost, you, you want it for the first time, come up here and sit in one of these chairs. And so the people would come. And he said they had 50 people that sat in the chairs. When the 50 people came, he said, we knew there were going to be 50 people that were seeking for the Holy Ghost. And he said the missionary that was there, he pulled out his little ledger, and he wrote down 50 received the Holy Ghost. He said, wait a minute, brother. 
Hey, wait, wait, wait just a minute. He said, we haven't even prayed for them yet. And the missionary said, if 50 pray, 50 will receive it. That's, you talk about expecting it. Somebody said, well, I don't know how that works. I want to tell you why it doesn't work here. Because we bypass the role of repentance. We get people all the time. They come to the, to the altar and they even weep in the altar. But they're not ready to change. They hate what they're going through. They hate the, the, the path of life they chose. And they're miserable where they are. But until they're ready to turn around and say, this is it. When I leave here, I'm not going back the same way I came. When when I leave here, I'm going to leave different. And when you make up your mind to do that, then God will fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're going to be back on Wednesday night. You're going to be back on Sunday afternoon. You're going to be back at prayer meeting. You're going to start reading your Bible and fasting and being faithful to the kingdom of God. Too many people just want enough parachute religion to get them saved, but they don't want to get rid of their old sin, their old record, their old past. If you're going to be saved, and we are at the last of the race, we are at the end of time. This is the hour for the church to get busy and start getting serious about God. Everyone heard, everyone that heard Peter they heard a message so powerful, it can save the whole world. He preached a message that has the power to save the whole world. And still, in the 21st century, the only way to save yourself is to obey the gospel. I want to entitle this today, Save Yourselves. Save Yourselves. We've been talking about prophecy for the last few services. It's not, it's not a time to be, to be preaching about things that aren't important. We're at the end. We're at the end. I don't have time to get into any of the details. It's been a week like you wouldn't believe. It's been two weeks like you would not believe. I get up in the morning, have prayer, make a cup of coffee, study till after midnight. Still feel like I, I'm not scratching the surface. I'm exhausted. The people... The people of Noah's day were given warnings for 120 years, and yet they still died in the flood because they mocked the messenger. Why, why couldn't one family, why couldn't just one odd family that lived close enough to Noah that watched all of these animals on their own walking two by two he didn't lasso them. He didn't grab them in carts. God brought them there. They're walking up this ramp to get into a boat. Animals that don't get along with each other. They're walking up a ramp. They're getting in a boat. Well, wasn't there one neighbor that would say, you know what? I think maybe let's just go spend a few days in the ark with Noah. He, he said, this is it. Everything's loaded. Before they close the door, why don't we go up there and just spend a few days? If he's nuts and nothing happens in a few days, we'll come on out. Why didn't anyone think, maybe I'll just try it for a while? But they died. All of them died in the flood because they mocked the messenger. There were members of Lot's family that were destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they mocked Lot and the angels that God sent to carry them out. I want to remind you that God did not send a message of warning to any of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, only to Lot and his family. And the only reason they got a warning is because Abraham interceded on their behalf. Make no mistake about it, while so many people today are walking in darkness without the knowledge of God, you consider yourself, should consider yourself abundantly blessed today 
to have been shown the grace and favor of God in this hour. I've been doing this for a very long time, almost 46 years. I preached what I believe to be prophetic warnings all over the world. The things that relate to what were current events of the time, I preached them all over the world. And every single one of those current events, those wars or famines, those plagues of death, the things that have swept over the world, the subtle changes that were happening in Israeli politics, the shifting of weapons throughout Europe, the partnerships that were developing slowly with Russia, China, and Iran, the implantable microchip, even UFOs. I've been warning about all of those things for over four decades. I know some people hate it. I know that if I would announce I was going to be talking about prophecy, some people wouldn't come. They wouldn't even watch it online. Some people even insist that preaching prophecy is a waste of time. And yet one-third of the Bible is prophecy. Ninety percent deals with the day we're living in right now. So although I've spent thousands and thousands of hours through the years studying Bible prophecy, you will never convince me that I've wasted even one minute investing my time in that. Because Jesus said, when you see these things, when you begin to see these things, he said, then you know that it is near and even at the door. We are admonished over and over in the scripture to watch and pray, to look up, to wake up, to make sure you've got oil in your lamps and even carry some spare oil with you in case the bridegroom delays his coming and you're standing out there in the dark and, and you're, you don't know when he's coming, but you need some light with you. Some people, people say, Brother Moses, I've been hearing that all of my life. It's just another scare tactic to get people to come to the altar and pray. But what's the other alternative? Not to just say anything and just let people continue to walk in darkness, to let them to continue to live in ignorance and complacency while they're completely unaware that hell is waging a war against the church, against their family. Jesus is coming. This is the most important thing right now in your life. I've told this church many times, if Jesus doesn't come next week, somebody said, what are you going to do, Brother Moses? You're preaching it. If he doesn't come next week or next month or next year, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm ready to go this weekend. But if I'm, I'm not going to be discouraged because I've told you before, I'm not a flight risk. I was here when he didn't come. I'm going to be here. Doesn't matter how many people come and go. They've been coming and going for the 46 years I've been in the church but I'm still here and I still believe he's coming and I still wake up every day, Brother Green, and I'm still looking up. I expect he's going to come because he said he would. So for the few people that, that are offended by what I preach here, maybe my advice is to just turn it off. If you're watching online, just turn it off right here. You won't like it. Go back to binge watching your favorite shows on Netflix where you'll be less offended at what I'm talking about because I'm not going to stop preaching it. Jesus is coming. And if the church that I pastor is going to be ready, it's up to me to be the watchman on the wall to make sure you know what's going on. You may not like it. You can go back to sleep if you want to. That's fine with me, but I'm delivering my soul. Every time I tell you, you better get ready. You better get in an altar and you better repent. This might be your last service. The Lord might not come for five years. If he doesn't come, you still might die tomorrow. You need to find an altar every day. More important now than ever in your life. And you need to pray until you pray through. You need to pray until you got peace and your fear is gone and you got confidence that God is still in control of everything going on in my life. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, he's talking to the church, apostolic, Holy Ghost filled people. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly. This has been drilled in you. You have a good understanding. Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. People that don't want to hear anything about the coming of the Lord, that's where they stop. They say we know enough about it. We, we don't know 
when he's coming, so we need to just leave that alone and stop speculating. But that's not where Paul stopped. He said, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But then he says, but ye, brethren, now he's talking to us again, ye are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He just said in verse 2, he's coming as a thief in the night. But not to you, not to you in the church, not to you that have the Holy Ghost, not to you that have a little bit of discernment, not to you that are hooked up in prayer. If you communicate with God, he'll tell you things. If you have a prayer life, he'll share things with you. He'll let you feel uneasy throughout the day. He'll let you feel like something's not right. He'll cause you to pray when you don't know what you're praying about and your spirit will begin to intercede for issues you don't even know is going on. Oh, I'm telling you, folks, we got to get back to being Pentecost. We've got to get back to being spiritually minded. We need to get rid of a lot of this baggage and realize our last mile home, it's going to be one where we've got strength and vitality. It's not coming on you. You're not children of the darkness. You're not walking in darkness. You're not walking in ignorance. You're not walking in confusion. But ye brethren, wake up. You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He's coming as a thief to the world, but not to you. The world's going to think that UFOs have come down and millions of people have been evacuated by some foreign, uh, some, some, some country beyond our galaxy. But I'm telling you, we know he's going to sound a trumpet and not every ear is going to hear it but the ones that have the Holy Ghost there's going to be something quickened inside of you and your body is going to disappear out of your clothes you're going to disappear in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and we're going to rise to be with the Lord it ought to get you excited every day this could be the day I may have taken my pain medicine this morning but I might not take it tonight hallelujah I may have taken my metformin for my diabetes this morning but I'm not taking it tonight He's coming, and somewhere between here and there, there's going to be a healing service. He's coming as a thief in the night for them. But for ye, brethren, notice how the same event relates to us and them. It's the same event, but it relates differently to us and them. He said, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, be drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Hallelujah. I'm not looking for the tribulation. He said, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that word, that means we're going to have deliverance. Uh, uh, when, when you relate, the way you relate to the signs of the time is actually determined by whether you're classified in the us or the them category. I'm in the us category. I know that I, I don't have to worry about what's coming tomorrow. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Even in death, Brother Green, if we go by the way of the grave, we may cry because we lost them. But we're not crying because they have no hope. We know that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ, they're going to rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together to meet them in the air with the Lord and so shall we ever be with him I'm going to go back a little bit here a few years when we first heard about COVID we were all forced to shut everything down including the church I told my wife back then I said something just happened in the spirit world I walked the floor for days I said, I don't know what to do about it. I, I, never, I never dreaded the role of a pastor more than that time. We've never been here before. Nobody's talking about it. When you call somebody for advice, 
What are you doing? What, what do you think we ought to do? Nobody knows. We're all standing, waiting for a fresh word from God. And the things that were set into motion, including the radical changes all over the world, those things have never slowed down since COVID. Right. Something really did was really set free in the world. I will never forget what it was like to preach in an empty building. I struggled with an anxious heart, a troubled spirit all the time. I wondered what our next step was going to be. I did way too many COVID funerals for people we loved, and yet we had to let them die alone. Many of our friends died during that time around the country, and they were buried with family-only funerals. Many of them were buried with closed, closed caskets. I preached funerals with closed caskets, rubber gloves, and a face mask. I preached them outside. It, it, seemed, it seemed that you go to a, to a funeral and there's a closed casket. You don't, ever, you don't see the person again. They left their house. They went to the hospital. You didn't see them. Maybe a family member that took them there. You didn't see them again. And then you never saw them again, not even, not even in a casket. So I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but, it, but it's, it's something to me. It seems like it denies the family, the friends, some real, real sense of closure. Maybe that don't make any sense to you. But it was for, for me, it was extremely hard to process. We buried them. We'll never see them again. And yet we didn't see them even at the funeral. But I told my wife and I told this church back then, I told you, even from an empty building, I think me and Brother Staggs was the only one in here. I said, God is trying to get our attention. I said back then, told this church, God God is not speaking to the world. They're not going to get it. Because the warning was not for the world. It was for the church. Paul said, we are not in darkness. We are not of the night. We are the church. We are the church of the living God. We should, have, we should all have enough discernment. No matter how long you've been in the church, you ought to have enough discernment to feel the changing of the spiritual atmosphere around you. We ought to be able to feel that, to sense that. Fox News was still broadcasting the news during that time, but between commercial breaks, they were flying drones through the empty and quiet streets of New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and L.A. What trash was blowing in the wind, silent, like they had muted the sound. It was a grim reminder that life as we had always known it had come to a screeching halt. And as I watched those images slowly passing on the screen with very somber music playing in the background, I was reminded of the song my pastor's wife used to sing many years ago, The King is Coming. The marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labor. In the courtroom, there's no debate. Work on earth has all suspended as the king comes through the gates. Happy faces line the hallways. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended. Those from prisons he set free. Little children and the aged, hand in hand, stand all aglow. Those who were crippled, broken, and ruined are now clad in garments white as snow. I can hear the chariots rumble. I can see the marching throng as the fury of God's trumpets spell the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding. Heaven's grandstand all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled as they sing amazing grace. The king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. The king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. He was trying to get our attention back then, and I hope that now, four years later, we have not gone 
back to sleep again when we are on the threshold of the rapturing of the bride of Christ. The greatest event in human history is about to take place and the church needs to get ready. You need to fall in love with the Lord again. If you haven't felt his presence in a long time, you ought to worship today in this altar until it comes back to you again. If you haven't spoken in tongues in a long time, you ought to stay in this altar until you feel the flow of the Holy Ghost speaking through you again. If you've got bitterness in your heart, you need to stay in the altar until you break that free. If, you, if you've got a jealousy and strife and you've got an ought against somebody else, stay in the altar until you make it right with them, until you make it right with God. COVID actually set the stage for a global one world government and a global digital currency that will be controlled by the Antichrist. And since that time, there's been a powerful global shift that has rearranged the entire global order. And all the while, it's positioned each character in the perfect place and within the perfect partnership to initiate the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. We watched it come together with our own eyes. The Jews believe the Gog Magog War is going to start. It's going to be a spinoff of this war. And then, of course, seven years later, we'll be the battle of Armageddon. I've watched it assemble like you have in perfect alignment right before our eyes, especially in the last four years. And since Israel is God's timepiece, it's a prophetic harbinger of what is to come. You need to be watching Israel. You need to keep your eye on what's going on there. And when you see them looking up, you need to start looking up. When you see them getting ready for a redemption to come, by, come past, a, a redemption of their people, you need to get ready. Your redemption is drawing nigh. When they're, they're looking for the end, they're looking for the Messiah to show up. You need to start as Brother Green said, looking toward the eastern sky. This could be the day. This could be the week, the month. This could be the year. And I don't want to miss that event. I don't want to wake up some morning and hear on the news that millions have disappeared and I'm still here. Jesus said, in Matthew 24, I can't read all these. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up. When you see the fig tree or Israel bring forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. That miracle of rebirth happened in 1948. He said, this generation shall not pass till all these things are fulfilled. God's prophetic time clock is Israel. It has always been Israel. God, Paul told us in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 that God is going to return to the, to the Jews when the Gentiles or the age of the Gentiles is finished. And that's what's about to happen. That's what's getting ready to take place. In Israel, in a Friday, being called by the Jews, the most important prophetic event since the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. We're not looking for a, a red heifer to be sacrificed. It won't do you any good. They can have five of them offered, and it won't do you any good. If you want your sins to be remitted, you don't need to look to that, that sacrifice in Israel. You need to get in that water. Some of you need to, needed to do it a long time ago. You need to get in that water. I'm telling you, if you don't, you're going to be left right here. You need to be buried in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, for the removal of your sins. And if you don't get them off the record, they're going to follow you to judgment. You've got to save yourself. This is why so many scholars believe that although we don't know the precise day or the hour that Jesus will come for his church, we can know the times and seasons when his return is near because Jesus told us exactly what to watch for. Most scholars agree that the fig tree is Israel. The generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will see the end. Abraham was born in 1948 B.C., the nation of Israel was reborn 1948 A.D. The very day that Israel was made a nation and the flag of David went up the pole for the first time since King Zedekiah under Jewish control was the very day that Yigel Yadin walked into the prime minister's office and said, we have found the word of God. He was, of course, talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
They didn't know it was the word of God. They didn't know what they found at the caves of Qumran was actually the word of God, a Bible, a script, a scroll. They didn't know that. They thought it was just ancient parchment. But when they took the tweezers and began to open the little tiny fragments, when they finally moved one over and they got it so they could read the first four words on that scroll, it was on the day Israel was made a nation. And the first words that were legible was from Ezekiel 37 and 3. Can you imagine the eyes of the person that took those tweezers and peeled that back and shined that light on the day Israel was made a nation? And the words they read was from Ezekiel 37 that said, can these bones live? It was, it was answered. That question was answered because the rebirth of Israel rising from the ashes of the Holocaust answered that question. God said, I'm going to bring them from all over the world. I'm going to reestablish them there and they'll never be removed forever after being uh, dispersed throughout the world uh, for almost almost 2,000 years. Uh, they were there. They were all over the world. Didn't even know who was Jews anymore. But God brought them back. And they, uh, Abba even was asked by a reporter at the United Nations after Israel's success in the Six-Day War. A reporter came up and said to him, how is it possible under such odds being outnumbered so much? He leaned into the microphone and he said, because the God God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. Some lucky twist of fate. There is an almighty God that is in control of everything. Every step they take, he's in control of it. Every move they make, God's in control of it. And I'm telling you, if you got the Holy Ghost, the Bible said the steps of a good man, they are ordered of the Lord. There's all kinds of traps that hell has laid for you. But the Bible said he directed our foot by the snare of the fowler. You just keep on walking. Keep on going ahead because God's in charge of whatever you walk into and whatever you walk out of. It is God that is still in control of your steps. More happened in 1948 than just the birth of Israel. It was a year of restoration and new beginnings around the world. Israel was born May the 14th, 1948. The same day, Yigal Yadin found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The National Council of Churches was formed that year. The beginning of the European nation's common market occurred that year. The communists overran Czechoslovakia and barricaded Berlin. Those two events triggered what we call the North Atlantic Treaty Organization known as NATO in 1948. That year also saw what's known as the formation of American states. The Index of Leading Indicators was formed in 1948. The space program began in 1948. UFO research began in 1948. The microchip was invented in 1948. And the Treaty of Rome was revived again in 1948. All of those things were setting the stage slowly, progressively for the redemption of the Jews, for the closing of the Gentile door of salvation. It's what Rabbi Heim Richman called God's grand finale. Hallelujah. God's going to wind it up. This is his grand finale. And all of those things are exciting because they're pointing to the end. They're pointing to the catching away of the bride of Christ. This is, I've said many times before, and I'm going to keep saying it, this is not the gloomiest hour of the church. This is the greatest hour of the church. This may be the gloomiest hour of the world. Very soon it's going to feel like that, but not for the church. I believe we got revival on the way. I believe something's going to happen that's going to spark revival that's going to cause folks to really fall in love with him again. <laughs> there was another event that happened on the surface that seemed like it had no prophetic significance to us or Israel and yet within a few short days COVID-19 changed the world. It set into motion a series of end time events like nothing we've ever seen in human history. I heard one preacher say there were only two events in human history that ever shut down the whole world. One was the flood of Noah's day, and the other was COVID-19. Noah was locked in the ark, shut away for one year and two months. The whole world was locked down by COVID for one year and two months. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We are marching toward the rapture and the revealing of the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon. What is coming after the rapture? 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to make our current crisis look like a cakewalk. I do not want to be here when Jesus comes. The countdown has started. There's only one way to escape what's coming on the earth, and that's in the rapture. And if you want to be in the rapture, you got to save yourself. If you want to be in the rapture, you got to do something. you got to make a step toward God. You can't expect somebody to do it for you because they can't. The church can welcome you and embrace you, but the church can't save you. Your family may love you dearly, but they can't save you. The preacher can preach truth to you, but he can't save you. You can even believe in Jesus, but it's not enough to save you. You have to save yourself. How do I do that, preacher? You better obey the gospel. You have to make an approach to God. If you want to make an approach to God, you got to do it by his rules. You can't come to God any way you want. You got to repent and you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and then God will make an approach to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want him to be in my life. I don't want him to be just at arm's reach. I don't want everybody else to be going down in the water. Everybody else to be shouting and dancing, feeling joy, and feeling the happiness Brother Green talked about today. And I'm sitting there thinking, I feel like, I feel like my world's falling apart. I feel like I'm in a dark place. I feel like I got the weight on the wor of the world on me. No, you can be free here today if you repent and make up your mind. I'm not going to leave the same as when I came. When the red heifers were delivered, I'm hurrying to the, the Jews began to dance and my wife and I was watching it. They were, they were delivered and the Jews that were there receiving them, they were dancing, celebrating because they believed. One of the men were interviewed there and he said, we believe these red heifers will change the world. He said, this is the greatest prophetic event to take place after the rebirth of Israel in 1948. And we believe that now this will bring the Messiah. I told my wife while we was watching that, I said, it's amazing to me that they seem more aware of the signs of the time than many Christians and even pastors. Why are we not singing, shouting and dancing and rejoicing because Jesus is coming back? What in the world's wrong with the church? when Christians want him to wait a while to give us more time because we still have things we want to do. We still have places we want to go. We still, what in the world could you possibly want to do that's going to be better than to finally know you're free from temptation, you're free from sickness, from sorrow, from death. You finally, no more disease, no more pain, no more crutches, no more glasses, no more polycrip. You're not going to have to worry about anything. Everything is going to be perfect. It's going to be the most perfect environment. Whatever you had planned you wanted to, whatever you wanted to binge watch on Netflix, it's not important. It has no relevance. It's all going to pass away. But when we get over there, it's forever. So shall we ever be with the Lord. You're not leaving once you go there. You don't have to worry about feeling like you're going to get, lose it when you get up there. There's not going to be a rebellion. There's not going to be politics. There's not going to be war. There's not going to be injustice. There's not going to be unjust courts. We're going to get there and it's all going to be joy unspeakable. It's going to be celebration. It's going to be happiness and we're always going to be together. Oh, I long for that day. I long for that day. Jesus said in Matthew 24, the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will see everything else come together. To set the stage for the end of the church age, the rapture of the church, the great tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist. You'll see it come together. And we have, Daniel said, in the last days, knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge began increasing at the turn of the 20th century. Said that, according to Time Life books about the history of the century, said the first 18 years of the century, all the inventions that were done in the first 18 years of the century were the seed inventions to everything we know now. There were more inventions in the first 18 century, in the first 18 years of the 20th century than all the history of mankind combined. Daniel said in the last days, man's knowledge would be increased. At the same time, when the knowledge was increased, the Bible also said in the last days, 
God would pour out his spirit. The Bible also said in the last days, the latter rains would return. <laughs> While there was a great industrial revolution going on from 1900 to 1918, our rabbi in Israel, our, our guide, well, in a rabbi, he was, he was a guide. He said, the Jewish record shows The Bible said that God said he would punish Israel. If you forget me, Israel, God said, I will make your land a land of perpetual hissing. Your neighbors are going to walk by and say, look at the desolation there. That was the blessed land of God. How would he do that? He said, by shutting off the latter rain in its season. But Joel prophesied that he would restore the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, and the locust have eaten. How would he do that? By restoring the latter rain in its season. Our guide in Israel said, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Jewish record shows it did not rain a single drop of latter rain that year. He said, and for 1,920 years, it did not rain a drop of latter rain in its season. But he said something happened at the turn of the century. In 1901, many of the Jews, in fact, our guide, his family, they walked back to Israel from, I think it was from the Soviet Union. They walked back and resettled the land. And for the first time in 1,920 years, it began to rain latter rain in its season. Why is that important? Because at the same time, there was a, the Lord said also, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Upon the servants and the handmaids of those days, will I pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy. In 1901, while there was an industrial revolution being born, knowledge was being increased. There was also latter rain that began to fall in Israel for the first time in 1,920 years. And at the same time, there was a prayer meeting going on in Topeka, Kansas, that sparked what we call the Azusa Street Revivals. When the Holy Ghost fell in that chamber with those young ladies in a prayer meeting, I'm telling you, Israel is, Israel is restored. Knowledge has been increased. And revival is once again spreading across the world. I'm telling you we are living in the last days and everything that's going on in our environment right now, it was all divinely ordained of God. Everything is going according to the plan. If you want to be a part of that great rapture, that great celebration, marriage, supper, the Lamb, if you want to be there when we crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you've got to save yourself. One writer said there's been more prophecy fulfilled in this generation than all the centuries, 19th century since Christ. We're drawing to a close the sixth millennium since the sin of Adam or 6,000 years of man's time. The angel told Daniel in Daniel 12 and 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even until the time of the end. For many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. It was an end time prophecy he was talking about. There's been more earthquakes and volcanoes in this century than all the 19th century since Christ. America's lost respect for morals, purity, life, and God. They want God out of our schools, out of our homes, our government, off our money, out of the Pledge of Allegiance, out of Christmas, out of Easter, off the radio, off television. I can tell you it won't be long. We will be out. We're going to be out of everything because we're going to be gone. Jesus said, you'll be hated for my name's sake. Don't take it personal. Don't get upset because somebody hurt your feelings. America's not only in decline, America's in a free fall. God is trying to get the attention of the church. This is your greatest hour. This is a time to get busy about the work of the kingdom of God. God has a plan that's powerful enough to save the whole world. But if you don't follow it, if you don't personally obey it, it's powerless to save you. Romans chapter 1 tells us the whole world has gone mad. Why? Because they're calling good evil and evil good. It's because they've been turned over to a reprobate mind. A Missouri high school picked a male student 
as their homecoming queen. Time magazine listed a transgender man as woman of the year. A few months ago, a song and an album from a drag queen made the top of the Christian music charts. Hundreds of trans men entered into the Miss Universe pageant, and many of them got there because they won in their own countries. Latest Supreme Court nominee couldn't even define what a woman is. Facebook even released a pregnant man emoji. We've been watching pastors, church members being arrested, beaten, put into solitary confinement for simply gathering for church services. It's so bizarre. My wife said, this feels like we're in a twilight zone. None of this makes any sense. What makes it more bizarre is how quickly the population goes along with it without ever pushing back. For 6,000 years, there was no question about how many genders there are. And if you're wondering, there's still only two. Every child knew by two years old, there's only two genders, male and a female. But now you're not allowed to say it. Hey Amen. I'm going to, I got to close. Stand with me. William Seymour prophesied. I talked a lot about it here when I talked about Azusa Street Revival. Asbury, I think I talked about it with Asbury. William Seymour was the preacher that was conducting the revival at Azusa Street in 19, 1906, I think, maybe to 1910. But he prophesied that in about 100 years, in 1910, he stood up on the pulpit and said, in about 100 years, another revival greater than Azusa Street, greater than Topeka, Kansas, greater than the book of Acts is coming. It will not be restricted to one place or to just preachers, but it will spread all over the world, and it will end with the coming of the Lord. He repeated that prophecy many other times before he died in 1922. Meanwhile, on the East Coast in New York, a day or two apart, Charles Parham prophesied the same thing using mostly the same words. We're in that time right now. The revival that, brother, I wanted to talk about a little bit today. I don't have time to get into it, but the revival that, brother, Charles Robinette believes the Lord sent him back to America to get the American church ready for a billion soul revival. That revival is happening all over the world. It is amazing how many people are getting the Holy Ghost in huge waves and people by the tens of thousands are being healed, instantly healed, made whole. From every imaginable disease and affliction, they're being made whole. Some people believe the Lord's going to come on April the 8th at the eclipse. Some people believe the Lord's going to come Friday with the offering of the red heifer. Some people believe it's going to be just a couple of days after the April the 8th. I'm not in those camps. He could. He could. He's God Almighty. He don't have to do it the way I think it's going to be done. I believe we're going to have a little bit of a revival before he comes. I don't believe it's going to be long. It's going to be, I believe it's going to be a few weeks maybe, real short. A few weeks, maybe a couple of months. And whatever God's going to do, I believe he's going to do it then under a time of great persecution. But I'm ready for whatever, whatever God's got planned. I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. I want to tell you, I'm going to do everything I can do to help you be ready to meet God, but I can't save you. You need to save yourself. All I can do is tell you how to do it. You need to save yourself. If you have never repented of your sins, if you've never been baptized in his name, if you've never been filled with his spirit, you need to be in this altar today. You need to pray until you pray through. If you'll really, truly repent, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. I remember Brother L.P. Upton going to, I think it was Papua New Guinea. So we went over there to do a missions crusade. 
We got over there. He said we were, we were given our altar call and the people came. Just people everywhere. You couldn't even, you couldn't walk. They were just touching each other in the floor and they were kneeling down and they were weeping and praying and some people were possessed with devils. And he said, we just started leaving the platform to go pray for them. And he said, the missionary stopped us. And he said, don't, don't lay hands on them. They don't need your help to repent. If they repent, they need to repent on their own. We don't do that in America. Our missionary said, we didn't even know what to do. And there was a couple of guys obviously filled with devils, and we were going to go lay hands on them. And they said, no. They can pray the name of Jesus. If they want the devils to leave, the name of Jesus is powerful enough, and the devils will flee. Brother Upton said, we stood there and watched them. We watched those people pray the devil out of themselves. And when the devil left, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. When the people that were repenting got done crying and weeping and snotting tears everywhere, when they got done repenting, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. They didn't need us to coach them. They didn't need us to push them. They didn't need us to do it for them. And we can't. We may just be delaying you. But if you need something from God, you got to get serious. Jesus is coming. And you're, I'm glad you're here today. But you don't want to come. You don't want to be here the day after the rapture and say, I wish I would have done something. When that preacher was preaching, he was telling me how to save myself. And I didn't pay any attention. I want to open these altars today. I'm going to open them to saints, sinners, visitors, backsliders, whoever you are. If you've got something you need to get under the blood, I don't care how many years you've lived for God, get in this altar. Save yourselves. Save yourselves. Repent. Obey the gospel. Obey the word of God. If you've never been baptized in his name, we've got warm water ready today. We can baptize you in Jesus' name. Your sins will be remitted. They'll be washed away. It's a chance for you to get a brand new start. Let's seek the Lord. Let's seek the Lord. Hello.